One of the scariest times in my life was when I was inner tubing down a river that was flooded and swollen. And so it wasn't so much white water rafting as it was brown water rafting. And there was debris in the river, and I had lost sight of the friends that I'd started the day with. Another time that was one of the scariest moments of my life was when I was riding on a dirt bike and I must have hit a rock or something, but the whole bike bucked up under me like a horse was trying to get rid of me. And the only part of my body to stay connected to the bike was the hand pulling on the throttle. And so I held on for dear life as the bike peeled away from me faster and faster. And one of the final times in my life that comes to mind when I think of scary moments is the first time I was home alone with my first baby. She was two or three months old. Um, Emmy and uh, Megan, my wife, had an opportunity to have a girl's night out, go to dinner. And I said, oh, yeah, go. I've got it. It'll be fine. And then at some point in the evening, something happened and Emmy was crying and I couldn't get her to stop. And she was crying and she was crying and she was crying and I, there's nothing I could do to make it better. And the common trait on all those instances is that I felt out of control. There's nothing I could do to get control. I felt scared, desperate. I felt cornered, angry even. And so I wonder, by a show of hands, how many of you have ever been in a situation where you didn't feel in control? And I wonder, maybe you felt scared or, or frustrated even. Because when we're in a situation like that, it's easy to feel scared or to feel threatened because we aren't sure how it's going to turn out. We aren't sure that it's going to go well for us. We aren't sure if we're going to get through it unscathed. And so one of the most common reactions to a situation like that is for us to try and regain control, to try and take hold of the situation, to try and exert whatever power we have to ensure our safety. Because if we don't take control, it might end badly. And that's a natural reaction, isn't it? Well, as we'll see from our Bible passage today, moments like that reveal to us what truly has power in our lives. The thing that we put our hope in to save us, the, the way that we try to regain control, that is the thing that we think is the most powerful thing in our lives. And in those situations, we get to see whether the most powerful thing in our lives is actually enough. So open your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 4. If you're using the black seatback Bible that's in the seatback in front of you, it's on page 92 of the New Testament. And as you find Acts chapter 4, I'll remind you that this is actually part two of the story that we started reading last week. Now, last week, if you were here, you would remember that Peter and John are on their way for prayer at the temple in Jerusalem, and they're, they're on their way there to be telling people about Jesus. And they're stopped by a beggar who can't walk, and he's asking for money. Now, Peter doesn't have any money, but he still gives him what he does have, which is faith. And the guy is healed, and immediately he's able to walk. He starts jumping around and praising God. And you'll remember this if you are here last week, but it draws a crowd. And so Peter tells everyone that it was all because of the power of Jesus, the true Savior of the world. And that's where our story today picks up. So let's read together Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 1. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came to them, much annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming that in Jesus there is the resurrection of the dead. So they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and they numbered about 5,000. The next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick, and are asked how this man has been healed, 
Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the chief cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and ordinary men, they were amazed and recognized them as companions of Jesus. When they saw the man who had been cursed, cured, standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. So they ordered them to leave the council while they discussed the matter with one another. They said, what will we do with them? For it is obvious to all who live in Jerusalem that a notable sign has been done through them. We cannot deny it. But to keep it from spreading further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in God's sight to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot keep from speaking about what we have seen and heard. After threatening them again, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all of them praised God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing had been performed was more than 40 years old. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It was while Peter and John We're still talking to the people, probably right in the middle of some incredible explanation about how Jesus is the true savior of the world, how Jesus is the true power for healing. Right at that moment, all the church leaders show up, right? Because that's pretty much the group that showed up. It's, it's the priests who oversee all the proceedings of the temple. And so that would be like things like the flow of people in and out the offering of sacrifices, keeping the incense burning, leading little prayer groups. In our modern context, it would be all the people who keep things going for a Sunday service, all the volunteers, right? You got the ushers and the greeters and the coffee team and the tech team. You've got the communion servers. You've got all the people that keep things going. It's this group of people who are in charge. And accompanying them is the captain of the temple, who would be someone who's like, an administrative person, so someone on a finance team of a church, or or maybe a pastor who oversees all the groups and keeps all the things going and fills the gaps. And then we've got the Sadducees, who are the group in charge. That's similar to a church council, or in some churches, it would be the Bible study that's not really in charge, but they have all the influence. We know what you're talking about, right? The Sadducees. Now, maybe a better image would be a citywide religious group whose job it is to interface with the city government so that the relationships between the government and the churches stay smooth. And if you uh, remember, maybe from Sunday school, maybe you learned this as a kid like me, that the Sadducees are sad, you see, because they don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They are devout Jews. They follow God. They are waiting for the Messiah, but they don't think the Messiah is going to bring the resurrection of the dead. They think that this life is the only life we have. And so they hear about the healing miracle, and then they show up to find Peter and John preaching to this huge crowd about the resurrection of the dead. And they were much annoyed. Another way to translate that phrase would be completely exasperated. They're like, wait, what the heck is going on? Who, who are you? Wait, we heard that some guy was healed and then we come out to the temple courtyard and we see that all the prayer groups have stopped, all the sacrifices have stopped because there's some huge crowd over here. And then we get to the crowd and in the middle of this crowd are two random guys talking about Jesus, that guy who was crucified a couple weeks ago. No, 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 no. We've got to get to the bottom of this. And so they arrest them And they hold them overnight until they can gather the right group to hear them out. And I want to point out that at this point, so far, there's not been any disagreement about the healing that has happened. There isn't even a conversation about whether or not Peter and John should have been gathering a crowd. It's all about the fact that Peter and John are talking about Jesus and the resurrection of the dead. 
It's a theological dispute. Right? It's a difference of belief. This isn't a disagreement between people who believe and people who don't believe. These are all believers. These are all people who follow God. The, 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 the ones in charge just don't agree with the beliefs of Peter and John. And so they arrest them. Can we imagine if that would happen in church today? Like, that's wild, right? Because there's still theological disputes today in our church, between churches, for sure. Different people have different opinions about what baptism means. Different people have different opinions about the style of worship or whether or not the Holy Spirit is still active nowadays. Different people have different opinions on what is sin and what is not sin. And can you imagine if we reacted like these guys? Because these guys in charge, they don't want to let things get out of control. So they grabbed Peter and John and put them in custody overnight. And it's just wild. But unfortunately for them, the crowd that had been listening and had seen the miraculous transformation of the guy who could now walk, they believed what Peter and John said about Jesus. And, and I love this part of the story because it shows us that as followers of Jesus, all we have to do is talk about what we have seen and experienced in our own lives because the Holy Spirit does the rest. A few weeks before this story took place is when Jesus ascends into heaven and his only true followers are left. And there's maybe 120 people. Out of all the crowds and all the throngs of people to follow Jesus while he is doing ministry, at the end, there's maybe 120 and they're there on the day of Pentecost and they get filled with the Holy Spirit and they start telling people about what they've experienced. And on that day, it says that God added 3,000 people who believed because the Holy Spirit touched them. And every day since, God has been adding to their number day after day after day as the people see how the family of Jesus, how this way of Jesus church has been treating each other, taking care of each other, talking about what they've experienced and more and more people have been adding to their number. And then today on this story, Peter just talks about what he's seen and heard. The lame guy that got healed just talks about what he's experienced. And it says 5,000 people believed that day. All you've got to do is be willing to talk about what you've seen and experienced from Jesus at work in your life and your family. And the Holy Spirit does the rest with whether or not people respond to that or not. But anyways, back back to our story. Now, the next day, we're in verse 5. The next day, all the higher-ups are gathered, and they start to question Peter and John. But they don't ask about the miraculous healing. They don't ask them about the claims that they've made about the resurrection from the dead. They don't even ask them about all the stories they've heard about how the followers of Jesus are caring for each other and how the whole group is flourishing. They ask about authority. Who gave you permission yesterday? By what power? By what name? Right? Like, whose authority are you acting on? Who do you think you are? The religious leaders knew that they hadn't sent Peter and John to come in here and start changing things. They hadn't led them to do any miracles or start any groups. And they were pretty sure that no other synagogue or religious group was trying to edge in on their territory or sent them as official emissaries. And so they say, don't you know who's in charge around here? You don't get to come in here and start changing things. I don't care what good comes from it. I don't care that that guy guy got healed. You don't get to come in here and do something unless we give you permission. And I like the detail that the author of Acts includes in this next little part where it says that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit before he speaks. Because it's there to remind us that this next part isn't because Peter's an amazing speaker. It's also not because Peter is trying to take control of the situation and weasel his way out with his words. No, he's just a regular guy, just like any one of us. But it's the Holy Spirit of God that's at work in him that allows him to speak. And he says, If we're being questioned because of this guy being fully healed, I want to make sure that you all get that all of this is only possible because of Jesus. You know, the guy you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. And 
I kind of imagine Peter saying that kind of sassy, kind of like, boom, take that, Sadducees. You know, maybe, maybe not. But, you know, he, he's going. And, and whether that was sassy or not, this next part, all serious. He's saying, this Jesus is the same one that was prophesied about in Psalm 118. That's actually the scripture that we started our service with this morning for our call to worship. Psalm 118. It's about the stone that was rejected becoming the cornerstone. The one that you rejected, God has made the most important piece. And you want to know whose name we operate under? You want to know whose authority? Who gave us permission? Jesus. It is Jesus' name that has all authority and power for this healing, for our teaching. Jesus' name has all authority and power for salvation itself. And the religious leaders are dumbfounded. They don't know what to say. They can clearly see that Peter and John, they're not like visiting rabbis from some other synagogue. They're not trying to move in on their territory. They're just normal guys. They work with their hands. They rub elbows with normal people. They're not scholars. They're not elites. And the religious leaders don't know how to respond. Because the healed guy was clearly healed. Even the higher up priests can recognize the guy that was outside the temple every day for the last few decades. And they go, oh yeah, that's the same guy. And now he's walking. So they send them off to discuss what they're going to do in a private meeting. Because they clearly can't deny what has already happened to the beggar. Because everyone who is at the temple the day before has already seen it, word has gotten out. But they know that they need to stop it. And I want to pause here for a second and ask, why? Why do the religious leaders feel like they need to squash this whole thing? The teaching, the healing, all of it. Why? Because the healed beggar He responds very differently, right? Like he's healed and then he praises God and jumps around and starts telling everyone what's happened to him and who is the source of his healing. And the crowds who watched it all, they responded differently too. They were amazed. And then they worshiped God and they believed in Jesus. But the elders, the church folk, the ones who are normally there keeping things the same, they respond by arresting Peter and John and the beggar, and then they try and squash the whole thing. Why? Were they guilty because Peter had said that they were the ones who missed Jesus the first time and got him crucified? Were they ashamed? Or were they threatened? Maybe they felt control slipping out of their fingers. Because this whole religious way of life that they sat at the top of, where people listened to them, came to them for advice, followed their rules, someone else was threatening that. The way that things worked that they were used to, it was changing, and they couldn't control it. How do you feel when you're not in control? Are you afraid? Angry? Do you try and grab on tighter? When something is happening to you that you can't control, do you cope by diverting your attention to something that you can control? Because I definitely do that. That is definitely the way I do it. Uh, these last couple weeks have been a little stressful at home. Uh, we have little kids and messy dogs, and I feel like there's a half million projects that are all half done at home, and I, I get stressed sometimes. And so a couple, a couple days ago, actually, I decided that enough was enough, and I was going to actually finish something. And so I went outside and I mowed. Not just the backyard either. Like I did the whole thing because I was going to get that done and I accomplished it. And after the kids even went to bed, I went back outside with the leaf blower and got all the grass clippings off the back patio. And I come back inside and Megan is surprised and she goes, why'd you go back out and do that again? I said, because I just wanted to finish something. I wanted to start it and I wanted to finish it. And it felt good. It felt so good. It successfully distracted me from the other things that I didn't have control over. But it didn't fix the feeling of the lack of control. For a few hours, 
I was a maniac outside. I was controlling every part of what I could because it helped me feel big. It helped me feel productive. It made me feel like I had worth, like I was earning my keep. And if I'm honest, that's actually a lot of the way that I respond when I don't feel in control. When I feel out of control or threatened in some way, I react by trying to grab tighter or grab onto something. Maybe I raise my voice at the kids to get them to listen to me. Maybe I obsess about some little project. Maybe I try and get my way through coercion or manipulation. See, we do those things when we are trying to regain control because something is making our authority feel threatened. Something is taking our comfort away. Something is frustrating us and we just want to control it. And when we react in those ways, it reveals to us what we think is the most powerful thing in our life what we think is going to help us regain our control. And so we use our effort because that is going to be the way that we regain control. Or we think that our intelligence or our charisma or our ability to talk to people is going to help us convince them so that we can regain control. That must be the most powerful thing we have. Or we think violence is the most powerful thing we have. If we raise our voice enough, if we threaten enough, that will bring the outcome we want. But that's not the way of Jesus. See, the elders of the Jewish people were threatened by Peter and John and the message of Jesus as Savior. And so they told them to stop teaching and speaking in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them differently than Peter would have before. Before, when Peter was threatened, he shrunk back. He tried to regain control. He lashed out. But this time, he says, you, the leader of God's people, the ones whose role it is to encourage us to follow God better, you want us to follow your will instead of God's will? Yeah, no, no. We can't stop. Because we aren't just spreading some propaganda to further our agenda. We're talking about what we've seen and heard, and it is good news. We can't stop sharing it. See, Peter and John had found the thing that was truly most powerful in their life. And for them, it was being an apprentice of Jesus, a follower of Jesus. Next to that, their safety, their control, their influence, all of it seemed less important next to the most important call on their life, which was to follow Jesus and point others to him. Because that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It doesn't mean that we show up in church. It means that we follow him and point others to him. And we don't do it to look better. Look at how good of a Christian I am. I'm pointing everyone to Jesus. We don't do it to gain recognition. We do it because Jesus is the only one who is worthy. And so Peter and John, they had discovered the truth that God's call in your life is the most important thing you will ever pursue. Because everything else is second because it's either going to fade or it's going to let you down eventually, or it's going to enslave you. See, the elders of the Jews had put their faith, put their hope in their own authority and power as the most important thing to pursue. But they only had power because the Romans who were in charge let them operate. In previous generations, the Babylonians who were in charge had destroyed the temple, gotten rid of the priests, no power there. And so, this power dynamic that they had that became the most important thing, it didn't last because 40 years after this story, a new Roman emperor came into power and destroyed the temple, got rid of the priests again. It didn't last. And then look at the Romans. They put their hope as the most important thing to pursue was money that through taxation, was power through violence and threats. But here we are, 2024, the Roman Empire is something you learned about in fourth grade history. It all fades. And so we can either spend our lives pursuing other things for our comfort, 
for our safety, for our influence or power, and we will come to the end of life wanting, searching, grabbing to try and regain control. And maybe you already feel that now. Maybe you feel wanting already right now. And maybe that's why you're here today, hoping that church has something of worth. And and I'm really sorry to break it to you, but the church building doesn't have anything else to offer that's different than the world. These church services that we spend our time in, that we have opinions on, even these won't last forever. If you have opinions about whether the music is too loud or not, if you have opinions on whether these are the songs we like or whether it's too cold in here or too hot in here, We spend our time and our influence and our power having opinions on whether our favorite seat is available, whether all these kids are so cute to have in church, or maybe they're just too loud. We have opinions on whether the pastor's doing a good job today or not. But this, all of this, doesn't have the power to save you. Only Jesus does. And what Jesus saves you from is the type of life that we've already described, the type of life that leaves us wanting, the type of life that feels empty at the end, dark at the end, bleak at the end. Jesus saves us from that and invites us into true life, a life spent following him and pointing to him. And so the question today is, have you decided that God's call in your life is the most important thing that you will ever pursue? Or is there a piece of you that you know there's something else that becomes the center of your life? When you are threatened or scared, how do you react? What's the thing that you naturally turn to in order to be saved, in order to regain safety or control? I I truly want you to spend a few moments today considering that. Because if we can spend our whole life, even in church, we can spend our whole life here and still miss the true, abundant, fulfilling life that Jesus offers. Because Jesus doesn't just want your Sunday. He wants your Monday through Saturday as well so that you can experience what life is meant to be. And I don't want you to miss that because there is salvation in no one else for there's no other name in heaven and on earth where salvation is found. So how is God speaking to your heart today? Who do you relate with in our story? Do you find yourself clinging to what is familiar and trying to regain control through your own power? Well, maybe God is inviting you to cling to him. Do you find yourself wanting or searching for true fulfillment? Maybe God is inviting you to invest in deepening your relationship with him, getting involved in growing as his apprentice and pointing to him for others to see. So how is God speaking to you today? How can you take your next step in obeying him? Let's pray together.